If they didn't know how to read, I would teach them how to read. Give them what they need to, to survive. Mm. If they drop something, I will help them pick it back up. Um, in India, I would like to give them food and money. Bring, bring money to them. Even though they don't have grocery stores, the money won't really help because they don't have grocery stores to buy the food with, them, with that money. I would like to tell people about God and Jesus. I would ask them if they wanted to be like my friend. I would like to just talk and sit down with them and see what's wrong with their life and try to help them out. I would like to help them learn more about God. Well, I guess I could donate some money to old people so that maybe we can get medicines to stay alive maybe longer or something like that. I actually might be a doctor for like three or two years. I kind of want to because I hear they make a lot of money. <laughs> Good morning once again. Let me say from the get-go, I love our kids here at Hosanna. Always have. Aren't they something? Did you hear what question they were asked? What would you do for kids around the world? And these were their responses. And you're good listeners, so you, essentially what you heard is they gave a perfect uh, strategic plan for any mission trip. I'd go sit down, talk with them, see what the issues are, what's the matter. I'd give them what they need to help them survive. I'd tell them about Jesus, and I'd ask them to be my friend. Bingo. Okay, That's what we do on mission trips. The kids got it. Now, what we're going to do about the grocery store issue, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> and our young friend at the end, if he ever does become a doctor, we'll send him out on the mission field for three or two years, however that works out. <laughs> and how about Maddie? You've already clapped and you've welcomed her, but what an extraordinary gift she is to us, right? She, her mother told me, she was supposed to clean her room one day, and rather than do that, she went in her room and wrote a song. How are you going to discipline a child like that, Okay. <laughs> And you've wondered what an angel looks like or sounds like. Well, you got an idea right now. And what most of you in the room wouldn't know is that I knocked on her grandparents' door 32 years ago when we were starting this congregation. And, and Doug and Caroline Brecky are sitting right down here to my left. And the Breckys and the Lee family, have, uh, those lives have been intertwined with Hosanna all these 32 years. God is very good, isn't he? Bless your hearts for being here this morning. Uh, there's, there's something in the air. You can kind of feel it. We're... Uh, it, it's a, a seasonal shift, and some of you deal well with this, some of you don't, but it's a time of transition. And every one of us knows that uh, most of summer is in our rear view mirror. Now, a couple people last night broke out clapping, so they're ready to kiss summer goodbye, evidently. <laughs> but uh, that would be sad, except you can't drive a car looking in the rear view mirror, and so we are looking at what's ahead here at Hosanna. And it's some good stuff. You're hearing about it. I'll just tell you, you know, just so you hear from me, this sermon series on the time of your life, we're going deep in the Bible, and the, the Lord has a lot to say about how we prioritize and use our time. It is a spiritual matter. Oh, it's going to be good teaching. I'm fired up for it. It's gonna, and, and did I jump out of a plane or not at this advanced stage? We'll find out sometime in September, a couple weeks from now, right? And then, you know, we're wearing these shirts to kind of get it in front of you uh, two weeks from today, 11 o'clock service in the CLC. For seven years, that was our worship center, and a lot of us in this room loved worshiping in that room. It was magnificent. Just the intimacy there, and we could hear ourselves and, and almost, you know, feel the people in the room. And so I'm looking forward to going back there and worshiping. And just spread the word, 11 o'clock on those Sunday mornings, that uh, that's a place where you can be. And uh, the fountains, it's going to open up this fall. That's on, the, that's on the docket, too. My room's almost ready. There's a million things going on here at Hosanna. But, so the future is good. You're in good hands. We're focusing on Kids Matter. A couple weeks ago, Ryan said Kids Matter, and the best gift that we can give our kids is spiritual development or faith development. And he told you why. Why? Because that's what lasts. You can give your kids a lot of things, but if you give them faith, that lasts for a lifetime? Well... For eternity, there's nothing quite like it. And last weekend, our friend Shay had a marvelous message about how we can make a difference in, in children's lives, you know, here at Hosanna and in the community. And he told his personal story, and it was rather extraordinary, very powerful. And uh, you can see that online. And I want to greet those folks who are watching online right now. Thank you for looking in. But I want to tell you, because I, I know 
that kids have always mattered here at Hosanna, all 32 years of the existence of this congregation. Some of you know, the Breckies would know, do you know the name of our first youth group ever at Hosanna 32 years ago? We wanted to be cute and clever, so we came up with, with the same name that you would. They were Hosanna's Bananas, right? Hosanna's Bananas. And they were a cute bunch. That We always said that. And they were. And do you know where the first uh, confirmation class met? In my home. First confirmation class had two kids, Tim Sibian and Susan Mader. And I know what they're up to and where they are right now. And since that time, thousands of kids have come through our power life, our confirmation ministry. It's really something. And do you know who the first youth pastor was at Hosanna? <laughs> You're looking at him. Why don't you do youth ministry? I did it for years. I just overcame my backache from driving across Interstate 80 in Nebraska. I did that five, six, seven times in a school bus taking kids on a mission trip. Loved being with kids. I have said for a long time that you know, our, our youth ministry here at Hosanna is like one of the engines that drives this place. And I can tell you right now that engine is purring. And if you're taking sermon notes, yeah, yeah, this is just a thought I had. You know, you can write it down. It's not, we always had a good youth program, and it's not, that's, not the, that's, that's okay to say it that way, but it's not about a program that we promote. It's about personal relationships. That's what you would write down. And we want to connect with the kids one-on-one, -on -one, and we want the kids to connect with Christ, and that's what we've been working on. Bibles can come into the room right now because they're going to be in our Bibles in just a moment. And so from the beginning of our time here at Hosanna, I think we built this into the DNA that Hosanna is a safe place and a, and a nurturing place for kids, and it is a, a place where kids come when something has happened in the community or when there's been a tragedy. And did we not see that this last week? And most of you know about this. And you have been down 35, most of you, just, uh, just beyond Buck Hill, and you've seen the place where the accident took place on Tuesday afternoon. And there were two fatalities there, a young woman named Alicia, who was 17, and a young man named Frederick, who was 16. Not kids here from Hosanna, but kids in our community. And the kids wanted a place to meet the next night on Wednesday night. And so maybe you saw this or you saw it in the news that on Wednesday night there was uh, kind of a prayer vigil gathered here, a candlelit vigil. And we lost track counting about 150 kids and some adults and some of the relatives of those two that had died. And our pastors were out there with the kids ministering to them and speaking words of encouragement and hope into their lives. And when something like that happens, some of you have heard me say this before, because I, I believe it in my heart, that God's tears were the first tears shed. When that accident happened, hear me, I believe that. God's tears were the very first tears shed. And why? We're, we're coming to know why. We're remembering why. Because God has a heart for kids. And I know Ryan and Shay have talked about it for a couple weeks. I just want to build on what they said. I want to stand on their shoulders. If you would come with me in your Bibles, I just want to show you one more example of God's heart for kids, okay? And it's in Matthew 18. Matthew's the first gospel in the New Testament. And if you did get one of these uh, worship center Bibles, one of the red ones, it's on page um, 889. Matthew 18, I'm, I want to focus on verse 10, but just come back with me. Shay, and I think Ryan as well, brought you in at verse 3, 3, 4, and 5. See that? Jesus teaching, red letter Bible, so we see these red letters. Jesus is speaking. And then Jesus said, verse 3, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this child, this little child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone, listen to this, verse 5, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf, underline those last three words, is welcoming me. Wow, what Jesus is saying. Now we covered that, so come down with me to verse 10. It's in this context, chapter 18, where Jesus is talking about children. And here's what he says. Beware that you don't look down. It's up on the screen or follow along your Bible. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the ninety-nine that didn't wander away. In the same way, Underline verse 14, if you would, in the same way. It is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Come back and look over these verses with me, back at verse 10 now. 
some of your versions that you're looking at say, do not despise these little ones. And, and what we just read is, is the literal translation of that. Don't look down at these little ones, these children. Uh, to flavor that word uh, coming out of the Greek again, uh, the word disdain would come to mind. Don't disdain them. You know, the, the sense of arrogance. Well, it's just kids. Or don't look at them with indifference, like, like you're not even aware that they're there. Jesus said, don't do that. And look at the, the second part of verse 10. He says, because they're angels. Would you circle those two words, they're angels? What's Jesus talking about? Do children have guardian angels? Some of you are nodding, say, that's what my grandma taught me. And some of you are saying, I'm not so sure. And, and to be honest with you, the Bible isn't really clear on that specifically. But here's our Lord teaching and speaking, and he's referring to, he's talking about the little children, and he's saying, their angels are in the presence of the Heavenly Father. So evidently, there's some angels that, that this is their assignment, you know, for these little ones, for these kids. And they're in the presence constantly of the Heavenly Father, and what are they doing there? They are interceding, and you know what that word means? They are just speaking to God the Father on behalf of the children. Speaking for, praying for, pre, you know, protection and for provision so jesus gives us the scene this is what's going on in heaven the angels are interceding for the little ones so be careful then how you treat them and how you look at them okay and then the, the story that we're familiar with the shepherd has a hundred sheep one wanders off and he leaves the 99 to go find the one and it's a boy it's a celebration when he finds the one and what's the point of the story the point of the story is uh in that last verse the point is this, how many little ones is the Heavenly Father willing to lose? Say it after me, not one. Not one. Say it with me, not one. Say it emphatically, not one. Write it down in your sermon notes, okay? Jesus is teaching us. God has a heart for every child. His heart's big enough for the children. And so clearly Psalm 139 verse 13 is not just for you and me, for middle-class America, for English-speaking world, for every child in the world, God knit that child together in its mother's womb. Psalm 139, every child. And the father knows every single name. How, well, how can he? Because he's God. What size God do you believe in? Pretty big, <laughs> pretty amazing. And he knows every name, and he knows the color of their eyes, and he knows the color of their skin. And again, I suppose I'm showing my age a little bit when, you know, when I tell you that in Sunday school, we sang a song. I don't know if our kids sing it or not, but some of you remember this. Jesus loves, loves the little children, all the children of the world, be they yellow, black, or white, they are what? They are precious in his sight, precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. So again, I'm building on what Ryan and, and Shay have said, but God's heart, there's no mystery here, folks. God's heart, his heart has been revealed. And his will is known. We see this from cover to cover. He loves kids. And in particular, I just I want to take that a step farther. And in particular, there's three groups that the Bible says again and again. There's three groups of people that God is particularly concerned about and focused on. And they are the politicians and the pastors and anybody from Iowa. Okay? Are you writing this down? No. Did you, did you start to write that down? Politicians? Well, of course. No, let's be a little bit more biblical than that, okay? Would you turn to Deuteronomy 10, verse 18? That's on page 115, way toward the front of the Bible. Otherwise, it'll be up on the screen. I, just, I want to add one verse, which won't be on the screen, and that's Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. Just going to back up, up one verse, okay? Here's, here's verse 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. Some of you have tried. You've wanted to negotiate with God. Don't, don't do it, okay? The Bible says don't do it. Just come into obedience. Okay. And then verse 18. It's up on the screen. Um, he ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you 
and gives them food and clothing. There's the three groups that I'm talking about. And let's write them down in your sermon notes. And I didn't get them in the same order as, as the verse, but write down, if you would, widows. Very concerned about widows. Has a heart for them. Write down children, or parenthetically, just write the word orphans more specifically. And then if you want to write down, you can write down foreigners or just write down strangers. Other versions or other verses in the Bible call them strangers. Those who are homeless and wandering in our midst. God has a heart for them. And sometimes they're listed together like they are in this verse. Sometimes they're, they're focused on individually. And let me just give you a few more verses that speak to this. This is God's word. Hear the word of the Lord, okay? Psalm 10, and you can just jot this down, look them up later if you want to. Psalm 10, verse 14. The helpless put their trust in you. You defend the orphans. A great picture, isn't it? God defends the orphans. Who do you want to have defend? You. Well, I'll take God. God defends the orphans, okay? A little bit later in Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. Father to the fatherless, hear that? Father to the fatherless, defender of widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. It's in the Bible. That's God's intent and his will. We'll come back to that, okay? God places the lonely in families. Isaiah 58, this is a good one. It'll make you smile and then think. Share your food with the hungry, okay? Give shelter to the homeless, absolutely. Give clothes to those who, who need them, and then it ends this way. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. Some of you aren't sure whether to laugh or not. This is an issue for you. You're dealing with this right now, okay? That's why you came to church this morning. It just got personal. Don't hide from relatives who need your help. Well, shoot, why do you have to read that verse? Because you're here. And then finally... Uh, again, Jesus teaching, Matthew 25, verse 40, and, and again, a familiar scene for most of you, Jesus teaching, and he's, he's uh, describing the judgment scene, the judgment day, the king will be on his throne, all the people will be gathered in front of him, and he separates the sheep from the goats. And what he says is, many of you, when I was hungry, you fed me, thirsty, you gave me something to drink, I didn't have clothes, you gave me clothes. I was a foreigner or a stranger, and you showed me hospitality. You invited me into your house. And everybody's surprised. You remember the story? Everybody's surprised. Well, when, when, when did that happen? We didn't, when did we do that for you, Lord? And then this is, this is the closer or the clincher. Again, Matthew 25, verse 40. And the Lord will respond. And I tell you the truth. When you did these things to one, hear this, to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters... You are doing it to me. Look at me, folks. Uh, Jesus, he doesn't paint fuzzy pictures, does he? Well, what do you think he said? Well, I'm not sure what he said. He, he speaks with clarity, and he speaks with authority. And I, I believe that in part what he's saying here is that we are not just to believe in God. And we tell you this from time to time. Even, because it's in the Bible, even the demons believe in God. Okay, so that's not getting us anyplace, just believing in God. That's a start. But you and I are not only to believe in God, but to behave as if God's heart has taken up residence within us. God's heart is beating within us. His heart for widows and strangers and for orphans, okay, for children. Now, let's just for a few moments, let's talk about uh, the plight or the situation of children globally and in the world. And some of you, you might think, oh, now what's, where are we going to go with this? Because you've seen pictures and you've heard numbers. And my desire is not to tear at your heartstrings right now in these next minutes. Uh, and I understand that there can be a numbing effect to just looking at numbers. Do you hear that? You can just, you can hear these big numbers and just I can't deal with that. But for a few moments, I would like us in the room to feel something, okay? The Lord has already said, don't look at these children with indifference. Don't, don't look past them. And so I would like us to have a sense of conviction in the room or a stirring of the Holy Spirit or a desire to respond and do something, okay? So would you write down three figures? Nearly 16,000, that's the number, nearly 16,000 children die every day from hunger. 
And as I often say to you, my dear friends, would you right now let that thought lean against your mind? And let's just pause for a moment when we say 16,000 children die every day from hunger. And we just paused for 30 seconds and five or six children in God's kingdom just died of hunger while we paused. And before I'm done speaking, just in the time frame of this message, it'll be about 340 to 350 children that will die of hunger. And, and we laughed because it was appropriate to laugh when she said, well, they, you know, we could give money, but they don't have grocery stores. No, they don't. And then I start to picture the aisles at some of our grocery stores. Would you write down this second number? There are about 153 million orphans in the world. 153 million. These are children who, you know, both parents have died or they've been abandoned or they've been sold into slavery or into trafficking. Folks, if we somehow were to gather 153 million orphans, that would make up the seventh largest nation on earth, 153 million orphans. Finally, would you write down there are about 4.6 million orphans in Ethiopia. Well, that's of interest, but why Ethiopia? I'll, I'm going to come back to that and tell you. And I'm excited to tell you. But write that down. And so have I, have I taken you to this dark place? And, and boy, this is, this is awful. No, not really. Nope. Look at me, folks. What I've done for just a few moments is given you a glimpse of reality for some of the children in God's kingdom. Okay? And now, what are we going to do about this? So I want to show you a video just for a couple minutes. And the first minute of the, of the video recognizes some of the pain and the poverty for kids. But then the second minute starts to sow seeds of hope and that you and I can make a difference and I'm going to speak into that, okay? Watch the video, please. Something here is wrong There are children without homes But we just move along To take care of our own there's so much suffering just outside our door. A cry so deaf and me. Oh, we just can't ignore. To all the people who are fighting for the broken. All the people who keep holding on to love. All the people who are reaching for the lonely. Keep changing. Okay, 
got a little theme going this morning. I don't want you to miss it. How many little ones is the Heavenly Father willing to lose? Not one. Not one. And Jesus said, as you have done it to one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. And now this little video you know, takes us to a place where how many people does it take to make a difference? Just one. Hear it? Just one. So the question becomes for us this morning, what can I do? Okay, I, I'm, I want to I hear this. I want to think about this. What can I do? I love the verse from uh, 1 John 3, verse 18. Dear, dear children, you know, little children, let's just let's stop saying that we love each other. Let's stop saying that we love each other and let us really show it by our actions. What can I do? Would you write down two, two words? I'm going to speak to those for a couple minutes. Sponsorship and adoption. Let me spell it out for you, okay? Sponsorship is something that we've done for years here at Hosanna, and it's perfectly in alignment with our mission statement. We're advancing God's kingdom. How? Everywhere. How? One person at a time. And so for years, a, a number of you have chosen to sponsor children, come into a relationship with a child across the globe. When World Vision came, uh, that organization came here about eight years ago and, and told us the story of kids in need in Tanzania over the course of two weekends. Hear me? 925 children were sponsored by this congregation alone. It was really something. World Vision had never seen a response like that. And some of you continue to do that. Yeah, it's, praise God for that, right? What does it mean to sponsor a child? It means you come into a relationship with a child. We give you a picture of the child. This is the one that you're loving and supporting, a financial relationship, about $30 a month, a prayer relationship. You can communicate and connect with the child in special ways. And so the opportunity has come for us to do this once again, because some of you haven't heard this story. Where are we going to do it? In Ethiopia. Where in Ethiopia? This is phenomenal. In a little community called Hosanna. It's not a church. There's a community called Hosanna, south of Addis Ababa, the capital city. And, we, and God has thrown open doors for us to have a Hosanna to Hosanna connection. It began, at least in part, when a couple of our uh, Hosanna families... Uh, Peter and Sherry Ide and Randy and Mary Beth Rolf adopted kids from Hosanna in Ethiopia. They're adorable kids. Uh, you know our, our friend, Dr. Gementius Buba. Uh, he is from Ethiopia. He has stood here and taught and preached a couple of times, and we love him. He's a spirit-filled man. He and our pastor, Tim Hatt, wound up in, at uh, Hosanna teaching and leading kind of a crusade or a conference, and guess how many people showed up? 25,000 people showed up, Okay. And off of our vision board, John Bermel and one of our associate pastors, Larry Lotzer, traveled to Hosanna. They are, they are cops, both of them, policemen. And they were uh, they connected with the, the chief of police at Hosanna. And for a day, they taught the whole police department ethics, biblical Christian principles on how to treat people, but ethics. And at the end of the day, they said, okay, our time's over and, and you can leave, but if you would like, if you would like to stay for prayer, we, we would like to pray with you. 180 cops stayed for prayer, and within a couple minutes, they were flat out on the floor because the Spirit moved upon them. Hosanna in Ethiopia. I was supposed to be there a year ago in February, but my dad died three days before I was supposed to get on the plane, so I need to go there. God wants us to, there's an anointing. It gives me goosebumps to talk about it, Okay. And so we want to sponsor some children there. We want to invest in pastors. We want to build schools. We want to dig wells. We want to help women get out of prostitution. We want to sponsor children. We have a plan for this. And the organization that we're using to sponsor children is Children's Hope Chest. It's terrific. And they're going to help us. And rather than me tell you about it, we got someone here from Children's Hope Chest. His name is Will Crooks. He's good-looking and tall. He's coming up to join me right now. Would you clap for him, Okay. Will, come on up. Good morning. Good morning How are you? Well. Welcome to Hosanna. It's I'm, my pleasure to be here. I'm glad you're here. Yep. Uh, you were with our vision board, I think, a couple months ago, talked about Children's Hope Chest, and we loved what you had to say. I'd, I'd like for them to hear it. Tell us just a little bit Absolutely. about the organization, please, Will. Yeah, I think uh, baseline, what Children's Hope Chest is about is about empowerment. We're about empowering orphans, empowering a community to care for orphans. We're a development organization that started about 18 years ago uh, in the country of Russia, yeah. where we had a small group of girls that had aged out of the government orphanages, and we gave them hope through skills training and through education, 
and through sponsorship. And since that time, over the last 18 years, we're now in uh, nine different countries and serve upwards of 15,000 orphans. Including Ethiopia. Including Ethiopia. Okay, well, this is what I, w I want the folks to hear. If, you know, we have the opportunity uh, to sponsor a couple hundred, maybe 300 kids, mm -hmm. or more, maybe more. What, what difference will that make? What will be happening over there at, at Hosanna, Ethiopia, if we yeah. do this? The unique thing about Children's Hope Chest is we've basically said, here are the keys to Hosanna. Do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. And so that is an extension of your community. You've just added 300 more children to your church. And those 300, and they've just added about 6,000 yeah. into, into their community. And so it's a community-to-community community model. And what you're basically saying through, I'm going to sponsor. Sponsorship is just the beginning, as you mentioned. Yep. Is you're going to stand in the gap and say, there will not be a child in this community that will die of hunger. There will not be a child in this community that will die of malaria. What you're doing is bringing hope to the hopeless. You're feeding the hungry. You're discipling children in an area that is being dominated by Muslim conversion. Yeah. And so all of these things are done. You're putting uniforms on the backs of kids so that they can be off the street and going to school and having hope in a future. I like it, Will. You, uh, you have seen mm -hmm. this work. You got a story to tell us? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, one story that comes to mind just in the last six months is, is in Africa, if, um, if you have relations before you're married, you become an outcast, if, especially if you're a girl. If you get pregnant and have a baby, that's strike two. If you can be more of an outcast, you're even further of an outcast. And one story comes from a 14-year-old girl, Cecilia, who was assaulted Strike one. Yeah. Became pregnant. Strike two. But was a part of a care point that's connected with a church. And this care point said, we believe in life not only for the child, but for, for, for Cecilia who was assaulted. She had her baby. And now her and her baby continue to go to the care point. And in, in, and in Africa, older children care for younger children. So when you show up and when the team show up to build relationships, you see Cecilia's baby on the, on the hip of an older child, on the back of an older child, so Cecilia can continue to go to school yeah. and make something of her life. I like that story, Will. That feels good to hear that. Uh, Will has lots of other stories, and he and, and a couple of his team members are going to be out in the atrium afterwards. There's more to learn, more to hear and uh, Will, I wish we had more time, but thank you. Bless your heart for being here this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you, Would you thank Will one more time? <clears throat> you know, before you leave today, I, I would encourage all of you to, to go out those doors, and, and we have pictures of children on both, uh, pictures of kids that are waiting to be sponsored, boys and girls, and they are adorable. And to you, it would mean about $34 a month, and, and I hope that some of you are thinking, for crying out loud, we spent that on a bad pizza last night. I mean, you know, $34 a month to sponsor the child and come in relationship with that boy or girl. And, and, and for us then to start to make a difference, as Will describes it, in this community called Hosanna, God's got his hands all over this. Would you stop and have those conversations? We've got a, a bank of computers out there. If you know you want to do it today, today's your day and do it. If you, if you, if you need to think about it, and, and I encourage you to do that, at least get the information this morning, okay? The other thing I wrote down is adoption. Now, a number of our Hosanna families have been a part of an international adoption. You, you see some of the kids around here, and they're, they're adorable. And some of you, a few of you, might be thinking of that. We have information for you. We'll have a conversation with you. But what is for all of us is this. We as a congregation are determined to come alongside those. I'm kind of doing this with my arms to come alongside or to wrap our arms around those families because there's some challenges there. And so we want to come into a relationship that is prayerful and supportive and encouraging and maybe we can offer some resources or relief to the family, you know, from time to time, do some babysitting, whatever. And we'd like to have that conversation with you as well. And that's a table that's orange out there if you look for that. And those people would talk to you about adoption or coming alongside these adoptive families, okay? All right. We can do something and we can make a difference. 
And now not only my message, but this sermon series on uh, kids is going to come to a close. And so these three or four things by way of encouragement, okay? They're on your sermon notes. Just a simple thought, but hear me. Start seeing children. A few years ago, I mean, we, these, these bumper stickers have been around for years. Start seeing motorcycles. You've seen those. Well, we picked up on that here at Hosanna. And we had a season where we, we put out bumper stickers that said, start seeing miracles. <laughs> it was fun. And then still seeing miracles. And then thanks for the miracles. It was a great season for us. Well, what I'm saying this morning is start seeing children, just as Jesus has told us. Don't look past them, but acknowledge them and be aware of them. Such a simple thing when I was in Tanzania and I taught in a school one day. I think I taught math. I don't know how I did that, but I did and I had a great time. And now we're out in kind of in the schoolyard and I, maybe there's 40, 50 kids around me and I'm talking to them and they don't have a clue what I'm saying. Of course they don't. But I think they like me because I'm their size. And then I was talking to them, <laughs> saying, you know what, wouldn't it be great if we could form a hockey team and we'd buy skates and be a, you know, be a hockey team? And then, I, and then I said, and I want you on my team. And I pointed at one of them. And at, and at first, <laughs> you know, kind of startled or scared, but then this big smile. And I talked a little bit more. I said, I want you to be my goalie. And whoa, wow, you know, that person lit up. And, and what do you suppose after just a couple minutes? I mean, I, again, I get goosebumps, and can't you feel it? Every one of the kids wanted me to do what? Point them out. The kids just want to be recognized. Now, that's just a start, but it's a start, isn't it? And so what I'm saying is start seeing kids and, and wave at them and, and talk to them and, and acknowledge them, okay? The second thing I'm saying is... Um, enjoy and treasure the relationship you have with kids. You, you know, you teenagers, you're sitting here thinking, gee, I wish you'd finish talking. i got to get back on Facebook. Listen, okay? <laughs> this isn't just a parenting sermon series. It's about kids, but you teens, you're, I know you're a kid, but you're a big kid. And do you not remember that when you were younger, weren't there some bigger kids that you, you looked up at? You know, oh, they're cool. Well, you're cool too. And take note, maybe, of some of the kids who are looking up at you, you teenagers. You can talk to them, bless them, encourage them. You who are single in the room, you know, again, I don't have kids. What's this about? It's about God's family. Guess what? All the kids are single, so you have a little point of connection there, okay? And maybe there's a spouse and, and a family in your future, maybe, but right now we're God's family. And, and so you have a role with the kids as well. And parents and grandparents, you're there, it's hands-on, your front lines. What I would say to you is, and do you know this? You're teaching the kids. I want to tell you to teach them, but you're teaching them all the time with your language, body language, the way you respond to things. You're the teacher. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. And so ask the Lord to help you, you know, to sow the seeds of faith and, and to be a good teacher and a good model for your kids all the time. And he'll give you ideas. Last week up at the lake, I, I uh, sat on the couch with my four-year-old granddaughter here, and she's almost two here, and I'm about, about as, I could die and go to heaven. I'm almost there, you know. And we watched the, the movie Dumbo. Some of you know this story. Cute little elephant who's got the big ears, so everybody makes fun of him, but then he learns how to fly, and now he's the star of the circus. Ah, we laughed, we cried, watched Dumbo. And then afterwards, it just occurred to me to ask Ellen, the four-year-old, um, what do you suppose this story teaches us? No, she wasn't sure. But I said, you know, I think one of the things that we can learn from this story is that we should never make fun of somebody who's different. You know, Dumbo with the big ears. Let's never make fun of somebody who's different. Because God loves that person too, and they might have some special talents that we don't have. And she said, okay, Papa Bill. Say this after me. Okay, Papa Bill. Okay? We're teachers all the time. Third thing I'm saying in your sermon notes is, and it's got a little bit of, a, bit of an edge to it, but it's take responsibility. Okay, And I don't need to explain it. We are the family of God, and the children belong to the family. We are responsible for them, one and all. And so let's wear that. Let's embrace that responsibility. And then the last thing, <laughs> let's just be like Jesus and take time for him and hug him and bless him and speak words of blessing in their lives and over them because that makes a difference in God's kingdom and so I believe this place Hosanna has been for a long time a, a safe place a nurturing place a loving place for children 
And I want to pray that we'll continue to build on that and that we can take it to other parts of the world, especially Hosanna in Ethiopia, because God's opened that door for us. And I feel his spirit upon us right now. Let me pray with you. Father, we thank you that you call every single one of us children in your kingdom. <laughs> Even those of us that have the white and the gray hair. Child of God, that's, that's who I am. That's who we are. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the Father's love that you have for us. We have focused on children, Lord, and, and, and much of it has made us smile and laugh. But then there's some of, us, some of it that comes as a challenge for us, God, and we thank you for that as well. And we have a way to respond, Father. We do. Many ways. And you've shown us the path. And so I do pray right now, Lord, your spirit is moving among us. I pray conviction in the hearts of all who hear my voice. Conviction. Desire, Lord, uh, to bless children, make a difference in children's lives. I, I pray that we as a congregation will sponsor 250 or 300 children or four or 500, Lord, whatever your will is. And that many of us will have the chance to travel to Hosanna and maybe they'll come here, some of them, and we'll experience and see and taste this relationship. That possibility is within our hands, Lord, and within our reach. I pray for all who have gathered this morning, Lord, for worship. I, I know your love is abundant. Your grace is beyond our imagination. And I just pray your touch for each person who's here. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Next week, Ryan's going to be teaching on rest. Labor Day weekend, godly rest. That too is a part of our spiritual formation. Would you receive this blessing? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit be upon you all week long. Amen. Have a great week. See ya.